Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 75. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. How's it going, everybody? I am Jay Scott. I am your co-host for the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, and I am here again this lovely week with my lovely co-host, Carol Scott. How's it going, my favorite wifey? Ah, oh, doing fabulously. And today, super fabulously, because I have a very super special congratulations to our great friend and business partner, Ashley Wilson. So Ashley has released a new book called, and my viewers out there can see this, it's called The Only Woman in the Room, Knowledge and Inspiration from 20 Women Real Estate Investors. And it's a compilation written by some of the boldest female real real estate investors we know and love, have the honor of working alongside. If you have not already purchased a copy, go to Amazon, get this book. It is absolutely phenomenal, incredible, incredible knowledge, great tips, just great people sharing awesome experiences. Rock on, Ashley. It's a fantastic book. The only woman in the room. Love it. And yes, congratulations, Ashley, and all the other co-authors of that book. We're thrilled for you guys. Now, let's jump into our show this week here on the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. We actually have a threefer for you this week. We have the three co-owners of a company called Precision Safe Sidewalks. Try that again, Precision Safe Sidewalks. And they are Sean McCoy, Tom Zold, and Charlie Zold, two brothers and their friend. Um, and on this episode, they tell us all about how they acquired this business, and they talk about entrepreneurship through acquisition. So they take us literally step-by-step through the process of buying a business, um, working with outside investors. So they've actually raised money from passive investors for their business. They've also gotten SBA financing for their business, and they walk us through the process of getting SBA financing. And they tell us about seller financing and how seller financing can and should be used when you're acquiring a business. In fact, I know a lot of us hate the idea of asking sellers to finance part of the deal, to put in some of the money for the deal, or to hold a note. But these guys tell us specifically why not only should you not be afraid to ask, but why it may be in the seller's best interest to provide seller financing for a deal. And they talk about how to structure seller financing, what percentage of the deal uh, should be uh, you should be using um, debt for, equity for, seller financing for. So they really go into the details there. They talk about one of the biggest mistakes that companies make when acquiring uh, a, a business. So make sure you listen for that. And finally, make sure you listen for the one big thing that you really need to be spending your money on to be successful during an acquisition. Fantastic tip there at the end. If you want to learn about anything we discuss on this show uh, or if you want to hear about the great book that these guys um, based the name of their company off of, we talk a lot about this awesome book at the end of the show. Make sure you check out our show notes at biggerpockets.com slash biz show 75. Again, that's biggerpockets.com slash biz show 75. Now, without any further ado, let's welcome Sean, Tom, and Charlie to the show. How are you doing today, guys? Doing great. great. Thanks so much for having us on. We are so looking forward to digging into your story. Gentlemen, you have done some amazing things together. And here on our show, we have been talking a lot about purchasing businesses, specifically uh, this year in 2020, when there are a lot of businesses that might be struggling or a lot of businesses that could need help or people are just ready to retire and, and just saving those businesses. But it sounds like you have taken an entirely different approach to your entrepreneur entrepreneurship journey. And so we just can't wait to dig in and hear all the details of your amazing story. So let's just start off. Gentlemen, tell us a little bit about how the three of you teamed up in the first place. Um, okay, I can start with that. This is, uh, well, Tom. Um, so as you can tell by our last names, Charlie and I are brothers. So, uh, you know, we've been working together on all kinds of different things for many, many years. And and uh, both of us had started on similar career paths, brief stops in journalism, and then we 
then we worked in politics for a while. But, um, you know, the two of us started thinking over the course of time, we wanted to control our own destinies. And we started thinking a lot about the value of ownership and started thinking that we need to make a change. So take a step back five years to when we met Sean, we, we all worked out in Iowa together on a campaign. And we had very similar jobs with very similar goals. And so we very quickly learned that we worked very well together. We worked hand in glove. We had, uh, you know, our skills complemented each other well. And, and it created a great friendship between all three of us that we maintained over the next five or so years. So Charlie and I kicking back and forth, hey, we got to start a business, but we just didn't know what it was. We, we talked about the pipe dream every time we had a beer together for I don't know how many years. And Sean knew this. Sean had smartly gotten an MBA in the meantime. Long story short, one day he sends me an article, Sean sends me an article called Entrepreneur, Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition, which uh, I know that your listeners have been learning a lot about that lately from some recent guests. The idea of basically being buying a business that is already functioning, already successful, um, and then taking it over and hopefully making it better and growing it significantly. So he sent me this article. I immediately knew this is exactly what we need to do, and uh, we need to do it together because, because uh, you know, the three-headed you know, the, the three-headed team for us is much more powerful than one. And so just like that, we were all in and on the road towards creating a new career for ourselves. And I think it was about two years after that date that we signed on the dotted line on buying our business, Precision Safe Sidewalks. And, uh, uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun and we, we don't second guess our decision for a minute. That's awesome. I love that. So um, can, and I'll let you guys decide who, but can one of you tell us specifically what is Precision Safe Sidewalks and how did you find this opportunity? And I guess we'll dig in, in into some more details, but at a high level, how did you evaluate and decide this is the opportunity versus the millions of other businesses out there that are available for purchase? Yeah, I'll, I'll hog the mic on that one too, because once we talk about the, uh, start talking about the analysis and the math part, you won't hear from me again. <laughs> um, our business is Precision Safe Sidewalks, and, and I'll, I'll just very briefly describe it. First of all, our clients are municipalities and anybody else that has a whole bunch of sidewalks to maintain. And what we do is make, you know, we create trip hazard removal programs for those entities. So basically what that means is we come in with our team of surveyors, we map out, in some cases, in some instances, the entire city. We find where all their trip hazards are, all of their liabilities are, and then we, and then we, we map those, and, um, including the severity of the trip hazard. We then send the client a heat map that shows them, hey, here's where your problem is. You tell us what you want to do about it. Then they choose, here's what we want to fix, here's what we don't. And then they send in our team of technicians, and then they come in. We have patented technology and a patented prog- uh, process that basically makes these trip hazards disappear uh, faster and more effectively than any of our competition. So, you know, the result of this obviously is, is more walkable neighborhoods or whatever it is we were fixing. Walkability is, is becoming very, very important to people across the country nowadays. Um, and then of course, it also helps reduce the amount of liability that our clients have. Because when somebody trips and falls on a sidewalk hazard, you can, you can imagine that sometimes that becomes a very costly proposition for the city. So it's a great service and, and we've been extremely happy with the company. So how did you find this company? I mean, it, was, it, was it listed on a business website somewhere? Did you know somebody who happened to be selling it? Um, I mean, what, what, what led you down the path of yeah. we're going we're gonna to do this versus, again, a million other potential opportunities that are out there? Yeah. So um, actually, I think a lot of your listeners will be surprised to, to find out that we found our business on Biz Buy Sell. And I say that people would be surprised to hear that because a lot of people who do these search funds, and I think Charlie will talk to you a little bit more about what a search fund is, but, but the, the style in which we did this, a lot of people uh, kind of poo-poo the online websites, especially the non-paid one, like Biz Buy Sell. Biz Buy Sell, for those who don't know, is an online marketplace where people all over the country can list their businesses that are for sale. And once you get to a higher level, um, you're not really going to be using biz buy sell anymore because at that point you have a relationship with brokers or if you're at an even higher level than that, investment bankers, and you're going to get off market deals. You're going to see, you're going to see opportunities before anybody else does. It's true that that's overall the better way, but for anybody who's thinking about doing this, starting from total scratch, which is what we did, no contacts, no real experience. Sean had, Sean had, uh, had a small business before this, but it was nothing like this. Um, you know, for those who haven't done anything like this, I would encourage them to 
don't sleep on biz buy sell. There are a lot of great opportunities on there, um, you know, on, on the smaller edge, but there are multi-million dollar businesses that are, that are great to be purchased on there. That's what we found. And, and we were very happy with it. Um, we also did the broker relationship part of this, and that's very important. We, we, we found many great businesses that we, we could have gone for doing it. We basically Googled people, called them, told them what we wanted, kept close in touch, and then they called us with opportunities. And, and we took a good look at, at a lot of uh, SIMs that came, from those, that came from those calls. A SIM, for those who may not know, is a confidential information memorandum. It's basically once you sign off on a non-disclosure agreement with the potential seller, um, they send you the SIM and it's basically a big fancy pamphlet that tells you, here's what my business is. Here are the basics on the numbers, the basics on what we do. Here are some cool pictures, stuff like that. Um, so anyway, we, we, we monitored the online business marketplaces that were unpaid. We worked with the brokers and then we did also use a paid service called Interlinks Deal Nexus, which is, which is basically a, a slightly, you know, they have, it's, it's a, it's a paid for service. So they curate what you're seeing a little bit more carefully um, and there are ways that it helps you organize the sale if you're actually going to work on it. It was a good service. We found some good businesses on there too. But like I said, biz by sell is where we found our business. So, so I think don't sleep on it. Um, one, hey, Tom, I want to make one additional point on sure. uh, biz by sell and, and just the whole search process. And, which for, is, the, and for those who uh, are listening and not watching, this is Charlie. So uh, uh, this, yes. this, this, this is Tom's brother and co-founder. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there so people can get used to your voice, Charlie. Thank, thank you, Jay. We've been told that we look alike, but that we sound exactly alike. So I'm sorry yeah. for your podcast listeners. We're going to have to figure it out. <laughs> Uh, so, so one of the things, and I think this is one of the important lessons we learned, is that uh, the business that we ended up buying, if it wasn't the first business we looked at, literally the first, it was really close to the first. Mm -hmm. It was one of the first uh, things we found on Biz Buy Sell. It's one of the first sims that we looked at. And I actually give ourselves some credit because a lot of people would have just marched on by and said, we can't possibly buy the first thing that we looked at, but it was the right business. And while we looked at a lot more businesses afterwards and we were continuously I think we ended up looking at, you know, in, in various levels of, of uh, depth, over a thousand businesses, but this was it. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like when you're looking for a home, a lot of people will not pick the first home that they, they see just because, you know, they can't possibly settle on the first one. But for us, it was the right move. Uh, so you got to trust yourself and trust your, the metrics that you put in when you're looking for a business, because it doesn't matter if it's the first or it's the last, you got to just choose based on, on the actual particulars of that business itself. Right. I love that. I love that. Thanks, Charlie. So there's so many great things to unpack here. And clearly, it sounds like if you looked at one business that you ended up purchasing, even after you looked at nearly a thousand, I think you said, in some form or the other, then you clearly did a lot of research and a lot of prep work up front. So let's, let's unpack this a little bit linearly. So take us back to kind of the bare basics. Charlie, uh, Tom had mentioned that you would talk a little bit about just what is a search fund. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is that? Yeah. So I kind of think of it as the, as what I call the third way, you know, when, when we were trying to, trying to figure out how to become entrepreneurs, we thought that there were two options and the options were one to, you know, just work for a business, you know, work at a corporation, you know, continue sort of the nine to five lifestyle nothing wrong with that, but we thought that was one option. And then the, the next option was to have some brilliant idea to invent Facebook or Twitter or come up with some sort of genius tech idea that was going to take the world by storm and make us billionaires. And when Sean sent us this article for, for at least the two of us, it was a final piece of the puzzle falling into place, which was that we didn't need to have the brilliant idea. We just needed to know how to buy someone else's brilliant idea. Um, so typically the way you go about doing that is, is through a search fund. Uh, which is where you go out, you find some some people, either friends and family, or you know some people who are are interested in investing in businesses in general, and they sort of stake you up front. They give you cash to one continue living comfortably. You know they give you a salary, legal cost, accounting cost. You know if you need to get on a plane to go meet the seller, you know they'll provide you this upfront capital, and in return they will get either first crack at the business and investing on on some uh, preferable terms, or they'll they'll just be prepared you know from the start to invest in, in whatever business you find so it's kind of a deal you find with an inv with other investors early on uh so that you can then find a business um they're they're investing in you um so that's kind of the idea of a search fund um we ended up not doing exactly that we didn't start a search fund we self-funded our search which was where instead of finding people on the front end before we had a business we found a business we funded a lot of it out of our own pocket, you know, the legal cost and the plane tickets and all that kind of stuff. 
so that when it came down to it, we could keep a little bit more equity than we would have uh, otherwise in the search fund. That's great. I, I love that. We've talked a lot on this show about essentially there are two ways to buy businesses. There are two ways to invest in anything. There's debt and there's equity. You can borrow the money um, or you can bring in partners who share in the, the upside, but they also share in the downside. Mm-hmm. Um, and so ultimately, it sounds like you wanted to self-fund the search part. Uh, but when buying the business, did you ultimately go the debt route? Did you borrow money to buy the business? Or did you go the the equity route and bring in investors or some combination of that? I'll kick that over to our MBA, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we... Um, uh, most of these deals are kind of structured as, as a combination of the two. And so in our case, um, you know, we, we looked at um, having about 50 to, to 75% that, that comes from an SBA loan uh, and then some seller financing that, that typically represents 10 to 20% and then uh, an equity injection that uh, in our case, we had 30 investors uh, come in with us and uh, that represented, you know, 20 to 30% of the purchase price. Um, and so, you know, we had to go out and pitch a lot of investors. And in, in doing so, um, you know, you have to essentially uh, find a, a, an equity point where uh, you're, you're incentivizing the investors enough to come in um, because their, their money is tied up with you. Uh, there's no liquidity in this. They can't sell their shares. So you have to give them a return that is better than what they could expect in the stock market. And so they might be presenting 20 to 30% of the purchase price in the deal, but you're going to have to give them slightly more of the equity in order to uh, properly incentivize bringing in investors. So it's, it's an important point to keep in mind if you are in need of pursuing investors that um, you do lose a little bit more equity. But in our case, uh, we have a great team of investors that really uh, have, have helped us a lot along the way and, and provided some great advice. And so it's, it's been very beneficial. That's great. And so I guess that leads me to my next question. So you're raising money and you're pooling money from a group of investors. And you said it's somewhere on the order of about 30 investors. Um, Are these investors, are they active investors? Do they have a vote and and a say in what happens with the business? Um, Or are they purely passive investors who are putting their money in, they're waiting for you to execute on a business plan, and they're hoping to to exit either with cash flow or or some 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 liquidity event at, at the end. And if they're passive investors, um, did you have to go through the SEC and, and do a, a registration for a private placement? And uh, what, what's the process of bringing a group of investors together for, for a deal like this? Yeah, so uh, a lot of uh, important questions there uh, that, that go into this process. You know, one, you get to the point of, of accredited investors versus non-accredited. Um, that's extremely important as you're approaching people. Um, accredited is people that are uh, earning over $200,000 a year or have a net worth over a million. Um, you can look to friends and family that, that are not uh, accredited investors, but you do need to keep in mind that the legal fees uh, rise significantly if you plan to do that. And so uh, that is uh, you know, an important challenge if you're trying to keep your legal fees uh, limited. Um, additionally, you know, getting back to the, the question over whether to raise a search fund and, and giving up uh, 80 to 90% of the equity because your, your investors are, are taking that risk up front of not knowing whether you're ever going to acquire a business. You know, if you are able to, if you do decide to do that, you, you'll, you'll give up 80 to 90% of the equity. Um, but if you're able to self fund the search, you can end up keeping most of the equity uh, for yourselves. And, and in our case, we have most of the equity. Um, the investors are passive, um, but we'll turn to them when there are opportunities to use their skill sets. Uh, a lot of them are experts in their field and, you know, we have calls with them regularly to get their input. Okay. That's awesome. So Tom, tell me, so you talked about basically you guys self-funded your search um, mm-hmm. as opposed to bringing in investors early. You saved the investors till later so you could keep some more of your equity. Not all people, not all of us have the ability to kind of self-fund our search. Um, mm-hmm. What are your recommendations for our listeners out there who don't have the, the ability to self-fund their search and, and what, what can they do? Well, it, it's definitely a really important point because, you know, when you, when you hear self-funding, you, people must be thinking, oh, these guys are a bunch of money bags. And, and that's not the case at all. Uh, a step back, you know, what does self-funding mean? For example, searches often take up to two years. So people need to eat. You need to be making at least a little bit of income, right? 
Um, there are a lot of legal fees that are incurred just in the search part. You're trying to find questions. You're paying people to advise you. Um, you know, you need to build a website to show that your partnership is legitimate. You do a little bit of marketing for yourself. It, you know, it's not exorbitant amounts of money, but it's, it is money. So, um, you know, that's why a lot of people get funded and they do get, they do pay themselves a salary out of that funding. That is, that's actually perfectly normal. Um, then there are people who can just afford to self fund. That's great. Simple. You keep all your equity, you do it yourself. If you can do that. Awesome. Um, for us, we kind of created a third way and, and, you know, you notice here that there are three partners and I like talking a lot about this because it was the one thing that we were doing that literally almost everybody that we talked to who knew anything about this, they were, they, they cast a lot of doubt on it. They thought that's too many people, too many cooks in the kitchen. You're going to end up splitting the equity three ways and you're going to feel like it's not worth it. Uh, decision making will be tough. And, and we always push back on that because we thought that the three of us together, you know, it was, it was just more, first of all, you have to get along really well. And we already knew how to do that because of working together, but it also allowed us more firepower. Um, you know, our networks combined when it came to raising money, that became very important and, uh, you know, just support during a very tough process. I mean, it's a heck of a roller coaster. We'll probably talk a lot about that a little bit later. Just, just having people to talk to and, 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 and bounce ideas off of is, is vital. But in a more specific point, when it comes to the search, we were able to keep income coming in. So, you know, two of us kept our full-time jobs during this. One kept enough consulting work to, to pay the bills. Um, and so, you know, we needed to have three people if we were going to be able to, to push the ball forward on this because it's a ton of work. And if you're one or, or, or even if you're two, your funders are going to tell you, you have to quit your job. You, you have no choice or we're not giving you the money because it's that much work. So having the three allowed us to be able to do that. You know, if I was extremely busy with my actual paying job on one day, Charlie or Sean would pick up the ball and vice versa. So, you know, this was a really great way for us to kind of have our cake and eat it too. We kept our jobs. We more or less kept our incomes, not quite what it was, but, but, you know, and we ended up keeping far more equity than, than it would have been, like they said earlier, Charlie and Sean, 10 to 20%, you know, that's, that's not all that much, especially when you're going to split it amongst, let's say it's usually two partners. So I think that that's, uh, I, something we've never heard of being done before and that we would strongly recommend assuming you have the right partners and are very, very sure about that. Because if you don't, it's all going to blow up and none of it's going to matter anyway. Excellent. So I want to talk more about the experience in buying, in buying this business and the experience that's needed. So three was clearly the right number of partners for for the three of you and combined, you clearly have a lot of combined skills. So what are the specific skills that our listeners need to ensure that they have before they are going to be embarking upon this type of journey? Well, I think it's important to know that we didn't have any direct experience in private equity or company valuations or, you know, how to find a lender. Um, and we didn't really have much business experience at all because we would come from the political world doing campaigns we did know how to manage people, uh, so we and we knew how to, to tackle complex tasks. So we felt confident that you know when we actually acquired the company that we would be able to fit in uh, on on running the operations. But as far as knowing how to do a search and and do all of the necessary valuation and, and raising capital uh, that goes into it, um, that's kind of stuff that you can't learn in a book and you can't learn in a classroom. Uh, and for anybody that's thinking about doing this, um, they just kind of need to jump in and do it. It's stuff that you have to learn by doing it and, and just take the plunge to begin with. Okay. So let, let's say that our listeners do jump in and they do take the plunge um, and they start looking at businesses and they find a business that they think they might want to buy. First of all, let me ask the question. Um, should our listeners be looking at businesses that are struggling, that they can turn around and add value and, and rebuild? Um, or should we be looking at businesses that are pretty much on autopilot and self-sufficient and, and running well? Do you guys have a, a, a thought process there about the types of businesses uh, our, our listeners should be looking at from that perspective? I can take it, Tom. Yeah, so there's two there's two different ways to to think about it. Uh, there's there's if I would say the rule of thumb should be, uh, although there really depends on who you are. If you have a lot of cash, you're not afraid to lose it. Then there's nothing wrong with going after a turnaround type business. Uh, you know, the upside could be higher. 
It could be a lot of fun. Uh, you could do really interesting, great things. However, there's a substantial, a substantially larger risk if you go that route. For us, we were already doing enough risky stuff just on, uh, on you know, leaving our profession and starting a whole new career. We, our appetite for risk pretty much ended there. So we were looking for what you would call an enduringly profitable business, which means that year after year, it, it's turning a profit and preferably it's growing year after year. So that when you're taking on all this new debt, when you're, when you're bringing in these new investors, you can look at everyone with a straight face and say, hey, this business, even if we're not here, even if we put you know, some, some replacement level person in charge, this business pretty much runs itself. Now, when you get into the business, there's nothing saying that you can't improve it dramatically and, and increase growth rate and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but, but no, if, if, you're, if you're like us and you're leaving your career and you're bringing your friends and family into an investment and you're taking on a substantial amount of debt, I would suggest looking for an enduringly profitable business. Uh, and we can talk more about what that actually means. Uh, but that, uh, I think that's the smarter way to go about it, frankly. Well, so tell us, I would love to follow up on that, Charlie. So do please tell us more about what that means an enduringly profitable business. Yeah. So, so one of the key components is, is recession resistance, which uh, is something, you know, most of us here came of age around 2008, 2009 during, during the first big financial crisis. And that, that scared us pretty good in the sense that, you know, the sand could shift under your feet pretty dramatically and, and leave, leave you, uh, you know, pantsless out in the, in the ocean, like they say. Uh, so we were, we were very focused on this idea of recession resistance, meaning that even if the economy did take a downturn, that we would have a business that has preferably proven to be able to withstand a recession in the past. So for us, it was important to find a company that actually had financials going back to that, that time period where we could look at and say, hey, this company was still growing or this company managed to stay you know, stay at the same revenue that year. Uh, so recession resistance is a huge component. Uh, necessary product is another really important component. And, and these are often uh, ways of saying the same exact thing. A necessary product means that even if people don't have a lot of disposable income, they still need your product. You know, uh, toilet paper would be a great example. Um, you know, there's nothing, nothing you can do about it. You need to buy toilet paper. Apparently now uh, we need it more than ever. <laughs> that, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point, Tom. Um, <laughs> But that, that's, you know, it, it products like that. So it's, you know, obviously finding a toilet paper manufacturer is not exactly what you're looking at, looking to do, uh, but finding a product that's similar in the sense that even when there's the financial winds change, it's still going to be necessary for your customer. Uh, so that's, that's a big component. Um, Tom, Sean, anything I'm missing here? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, like you said, in, in endurance was, was our main criteria. And, and for, for viewers, knowing your criteria is one of the most important things. Um, uh, Walker Dybul talked a little bit about this the other day. It's like, you know, you need to know what you want. Are you looking for, for, for safe and the ability to grow it? Or are you looking to buy a company for cheaper and fix it up? And then you have a higher risk, higher upside. It's really just a question of, of your risk tolerance. For us, the three real pillars of enduring resistance, um, in, you know, enduringly profitable was, was um, recession resistance, and um, then we wanted, we didn't want to do anything in tech. We don't want to be competing against the next young geniuses that are going to be inventing the next Facebook. You know, we wanted something that was a little less sexy. That's kind of the, we wanted a non-sexy business. And, and I think we can all agree on this call that we definitely found one. Sidewalk maintenance is about as non-sexy as you can get, other than maybe toilet paper manufacturer. <laughs> uh, our, our unofficial motto was boring is better. Boring is and better. Right. Awesome. Boring right. is better. Make a note of that, Jay. That's good. That's good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Boring is better in this business. Ooh, so, so, someday when we get around to writing a book, we, we claim that title. <laughs> it's all you. <laughs> Copyright it now. Yeah. And, and then our last criteria, not to, not to prolong this, is uh, barriers to entry. And that's something pretty much anybody's going to be looking at. You know, you can't really hope for a, a business that has no competition, but you can find things that, that have not all that much and have strong barriers to entry. And, and we were going to look for our business until we found something that met that criteria. And like Charlie said, miraculously, it happened to be the first business we really looked at seriously. But, um, you know, that's the basic. And, and knowing your criteria is one of the first things you need to do before you, you know, really embark upon, you know, acquiring a business. That's great. Okay. So uh, let, let's, I guess, go linearly. So now we've found the business um, that we're interested in getting more information about. Can one of you guys walk us through what the process looks like from the day that you either find that business on biz by sell or a broker brings it to you or however you find the business that you're interested in getting more information. What's the next few steps to, to, uh, to, to figure out if that might be the right business for you? 
Sean. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, you know, once you've received the SIM and, and really taken a good look at the financials, uh, and like Tom and Charlie were explaining with, you know, recession resistance, ultimately, you need to make essentially a leveraged buyout where you're, you're piling on debt. So that's, that's where it becomes so important that you are able to um, service that debt and see the company cash flow when you're looking at the P&L and the balance sheet. Uh, knowing that uh, the financials are, are secure. So once you feel comfortable that you understand the company financials and the operations uh, by reviewing the SIM, you can set up a call with the owner of the company or sometimes uh, start with doing a call with the broker, uh, discuss how the company runs, learn more about their customers, the customer concentration, uh, how the company operates on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you feel comfortable at that point, um, you can then start negotiating uh, a potential purchase and then get into uh, the LOI phase, uh, which Charlie can talk a little bit more about. Awesome. Yeah. So Charlie, yeah, t talk to us more about the, the LOI, about your letter of intent and mm -hmm. what happens when you found that business and you were ready to make an offer. Yeah. So at this point, you're starting to feel pretty good about yourself. You know, you've, you've managed to sort of, uh, you know, fake it long enough to get to this, get to this point. And, uh, you know, you start negotiating directly with the seller. And for us, at least, our negotiation process was, was pretty difficult. Our seller was very aware of the worth of his business. We were aware of the worth of his business, too. And there were, you know, minor disagreements about this and that. But those minor disagreements took a substantial amount of time for us to iron out. And he had, he had been through this process a few times in the sense that he had tried to sell the business and had, had a, few, uh, a few similar sales not quite get to all the way to, to close so he wanted to make sure that on the front end, before he signed an LOI, that we were in broad agreement about what things were going to look like. The LOI, it's, it's, um, it's a letter of intent. That's all it is. It's intent. It's, it's non-binding for the most part. There are some, you know, some, some loose rules governing how you can or cannot pull out of there, but, but it's, it's, there's still a long way to go once you get to that letter of intent. Um, so we made the offer, he made counter offer. We went back and forth for quite some time. I would say probably took about a month just to get the LOI negotiated. We thought once we got there that it was all going to get real easy from there, uh, since we had done all this difficult negotiations and we couldn't have been more wrong. The LOI is, is, is maybe five to 10% of the negotiation process. Once, once you sign that, uh, not only do you have to raise the money, but you also need to put together a purchase agreement which is where really all the nitty gritty details are ironed out. And there are more nitty gritty details than you could ever imagine. Uh, so it's, it, was, it was a difficult process to get to the LOI and uh, for getting from LOI to close was even more difficult. So uh, you, you talked about, yeah, the details are where mm -hmm. it, it, the rubber hits the road. And I know we've bought a couple of businesses and certainly we've, we've had our struggles there between employees and inventory and things like that, little things that shouldn't be a big, big issue. Um, but I know the big struggle that we've had, and I'd love to hear this from your perspective uh, in your business. One of the big struggles we've had is with employees. And so basically that transition of employees from the old business to the new business, do you tell them? Do you let them know that the business is being sold? How do you ensure they stay with the business um, w during that period that the whole transaction is going on? What was your experience with the employee side of things? I know that's daunting to a lot of people. And, and what should our listeners be cognizant of uh, if they're buying a business that's, that comes with employees? I can say we've gotten to know a lot of people who have done this over the course of doing it. We had reached out to people just to learn from them. We've actually, we're proud to say we've inspired a few of these since that, since we've done it and, and then seen those people work their processes through. And, and I think what I see is that that particular part of the process is really handled very differently depending on who you're talking to. I've heard of sellers that have told their employees the first day they put their business on the market. Um, people, you know, employees who help get the sale done by, by, you know, helping sell the, you know, the potential buyer on, Hey, this is a great business. Come work with us. And then I think, I think the majority of people though, they really don't tell the employees until the deal is done. And in our case, that was what happened. The seller, um, you know, aside from a few key people chose to keep it, uh, you know, on the lowdown, which is actually very smart for many reasons, in my opinion, until the deal was done. And then, you know, we basically drove down to North Carolina and had a, a very, you know, we worked very hard on a presentation that was meant to put the employee's mind at ease. And, and, you know, our outlook on the business, we were, 
We're the opposite of cowboys who are trying to come into a new business and change everything. We bought an enduringly profitable business because we thought it's a great business. So why would we come in and want to shake things up? We want to learn, you know, we wanted to learn the process over time and then start tweaking things to make them better, adding things to make it better. And so we basically, you know, long story short, we came in, had a long talk with the, with the staff at the time it was 27 employees and, and we explained who we are, you know, what our style of management was going to be and, 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 and ensure that they understand that we wanted to learn from them and that we're going to plan to make this company better and your lives even better than they already are work-wise. Um, and so basically don't worry about it. Don't freak out. And, and naturally there are going to be a few people who, who do like the kinds of people who just oh, oh, change. I hate it. And, and we had to kind of work a little bit extra with those people to help them understand, look, we're seriously not these villains coming in to, to tear this thing apart and rebuild it. And uh, I think we did that very effectively. And, and soon, a- and soon after, I think people's fears were allayed and, and everybody was, was ready to keep doing business together. And we also had the help of the seller on that who, who helped talk to his employees and explain to them, here's what's going to happen. Here's what I made these guys promise to do. You know, I made, they're going to take care of you because, because we talked about it already. And then we did that. So, you know, we think that's the best way to operate in the type of company we bought. Yeah. Cool. Go ahead. Hey, Kelly, I'd like to add one thing here. And this sort of, I think the, the way to sum up everything that we're saying when it comes to the transition very important part of it is is just humility in your own skills. Um, you know, you, you might be feeling pretty good about yourself because you just bought a business. You did something you didn't necessarily think that you were able to do. You're feeling really proud and you should feel proud. However, you need to remember that the people that you're going to work with have been doing their jobs in many cases for five to 10 you know, plus years. They're experts in what they do. You're not yet an expert. You might understand the finances of the business better than they do, but they know how to actually do it in a way that you don't yet. So if you come in and you think that you're some genius because of whatever, your, your past work skills, your degrees, the fact that you're able to buy a business and you act that way, you're going to rub people the wrong way. So having some serious humility, believing it is a key component here, I think, to a successful transition. That is just a tremendously valuable point right there is staying humble throughout the process, acknowledging the fact that you're not the expert in this field that you're doing, although it's something that you never knew was something within your realm of what you could achieve, that you have achieved it. But like like you said, staying very humble about that and collaborating with everybody on mm-hmm. the other side to ensure a really successful transition. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that tip. I think that's just fantastic. And, and, and just one, one quick last note, just, you know, showing them that you mean it is important too. Saying yeah. things is great. Showing them is important. You know, Charlie, Charlie is is the COO of the business. He he you know runs the operations and and Charlie spent a fair amount of time cutting sidewalks. I mean he was you know he bought knee pads and and work boots and and learned how to take the saw to the sidewalk and that is really really tough work and and I think that it meant a lot to to the to the technicians to see that Charlie was doing this because they know that unless Charlie's done this he's not going to know how to manage them on doing it. And, and, and he's just not going to have the credibility. So you got to kind of get down and dirty and, and show them that you, that you mean it. And you're going to learn this business from them. That is such a great point. And that is just true leadership right there, right? Just showing everybody on your team that no matter what is required of the job, that you do understand what it's like to be in their shoes because you are physically doing that job to learn the ins and outs and all the intricacies of it. So awesome. Awesome. So once you've collaborated with everybody on the other side, everybody in the business, then it's time to fund it. So let's talk about the money. I'm so curious. I want to talk about the SBA financing, about investors, and let's start with the debt. So what's the, what's the process of getting the SBA loan so we can get this thing to the closing table? Yeah, I can, I can grab that one too. So S, SBA, for, for those of you who might not be very familiar with it, um, it doesn't, a lot of people think that you just go to the SBA, the Small Business uh, Administration, and just, you know, apply for a loan through them. That's, that's not how it works. It's very similar more to buying a home with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, where they're out there to just guarantee a portion of that loan to take some of the risk off the bank, to make the bank itself more likely to take on a loan that they might not otherwise if there wasn't some sort of government backing on it. So in this particular case, the broker that we were working with on the business had already, and to his credit, because he's such a great broker, his name's George Arapage, for those who are looking for a great business broker, uh, he had already lined up a, a, a small, an SBA loan broker who was going to help us find a loan for this business. So he put us in touch with another really great guy named David Madison, who knows the sort of the, the, uh, 
the landscape for for banks and which banks might or might not be willing to take on a loan of the type that we were doing. So we worked with David Madison to put together a pitch package to then take to a few banks to figure out which of the banks had an appetite for this type of loan. So working with him and then working with the banker, we were able to secure an SBA loan. Um, the, when you get an SBA loan, it includes taking on a lot more paperwork. Um, there's some strictures about how you structure deals. You know, anytime the government's involved, it's going to kind of add some a bureaucratic element to the, the process. But if you find a good SBA loan broker and if you find a good banker, while it might be frustrating and slow at, at points, uh, it's still a great way to get some debt that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily have access to. And I know one of the benefits of an SBA loan, and maybe you can talk to us a little bit, is that typically SBA loans are non-recourse. Um, I know not always, but but in some cases, like uh, you're taking a lot less risk than you might be if you're a real estate investor and, and buying a house with the loan uh, where you're signing a personal guarantee. Uh, is that the case or am I mistaken there? We did have to sign personal guarantees. Okay. So yeah. I, I guess it's it's like everything, it's it's going to be dependent on on the specifics of the deal and the loan. Okay, that's good. So let's talk about the other side now. Let's talk about the investors. And, and maybe this is a good question for Tom. Um, now you, you've found the business you want to buy. You've negotiated an offer or uh, you've negotiated a purchase and sale agreement. Um, you've gotten the the process started on your SBA loan, but but you still want to bring in, I think you said 50 to 60% um, 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 uh, I'm sorry, um, 20 to 30% equity investors. So investors to kind of cover the down payment and the, and the rest. Um, what is your process for approaching investors? How do you find investors? What are you giving them to make them comfortable with the deal? What's, what's that whole process look like with, with your outside investors? Yeah. And, and a, a key, a key part of this, by the way, is that you have to raise that much equity as part of the deal. You have no choice. So that's the kind of the bar is set and you guys either get there or don't. And, and, you know, getting there, frankly, for us was, was very difficult. It was a pretty big number. You know, again, back to the three partners, the three of us working in politics for all these years, you know, we, we had come to know fairly well a, a high number of, of uh, you know, of high individual net worth people. So we knew all these people with money. We had worked closely with them. We knew that they liked us. They knew how we worked. And, and we thought, okay, this is going to be great. We know exactly how we're going to raise the money. Uh, we even gamed out a list to get to the number. This guy's going to give us about this much conservatively. This, this woman will give us this much conservatively and so on. Um, and, and then we basically, you know, we basically called through those people. We created a, we created a, a pitch deck and, and, and practiced our pitch. And then we just, <clears throat> we basically just worked the phones and kept calling and calling until, until we hit our number, which by the way, and this is important for people to remember, like, it took us months longer than we had to, which was, which was a significant challenge for us. And, and really our big lesson learned here was that you never know who's going to give you money. You know, we thought, okay, these people, they've got the money. They like us. We know our business is good. We know our pitch is tight. This is how we're going to get there. And by the time it was all said and done and we looked at the list of here's how we got to our number, we were almost completely wrong. Um, you know, the people that we thought would give mostly didn't give. And because that happened, we expanded the, the net of people we called exponentially. Basically, we started calling everybody we knew because we were getting desperate. Um, and then it's just the people who you never thought you should ask in the first place who then wrote us nice big checks. And, oh, we never thought we'd get money from him. And, and, and so it worked out. But I, that's something that I think is, is a good lesson for anybody who's trying to do this. You just never know who's going to want to make this type of investment at this particular time. Don't assume anything and plan to uh, start early and work hard early and make sure you have your pitch really tight because unless you, uh, you know, maybe people that are working at a higher level than us and have been doing this for years, that's easy at this point. But if you're starting from scratch, um, it's just very difficult. So know how much you need to raise and have a plan to raise it. And, and so for, for these investors, are you giving them like, uh, are they making cash flow off the deal? Are they making money every year that the business makes money? Or is the expectation that in three or five or 10 years, you're going to sell the business for a whole bunch more and they'll get a big pot of cash at the end? Or what, what, is, what, is, the, um, what is that, that, that payback or uh, investment look like in terms of, of what the investors are getting out of the deal and, and over how long? Sean, I'll kick that one to you. Yeah, the way this often works uh, for structuring the, the investment for investors is they will take preferred shares in the company and receive some type of hurdle rate or interest rate 
that is being paid back to them as well. So um, their capital needs to be returned to them ultimately before uh, everyone is able to participate in the distributions. So Tom, Charlie, and I don't get our full distributions until our investors have been paid back in full along with an interest rate on that as well. Um, so it's important to get the money back to the investors ultimately, but then the investors, even once they have their capital back, they will then still be part of the waterfall of, of distributions uh, so that they're getting uh, some continued cash flow uh, as things go forward. Got awesome. It. Go ahead, Jay. So, so one more question on investors before we move on. Uh, you mentioned that in some cases, the investors are going to have a say in some big decisions or, or parts of the deal. Um, what does that look like? What types of decisions do you bring your investors in on, if any? Maybe there are none. Um, and then is that like a majority vote? Or how do you, how do you factor in their opinions on, on the things that you're, you're asking of them? For us, you know, we, we have a uh, significant majority of uh, the equity, so we don't have to go to investors for anything, uh, and they don't have any active role. Uh, we don't have uh, a board. Um, for most deals that are along these lines, uh, oftentimes the investors will end up with a majority or, or even, you know, close to, to 80%. And so in those cases, you'll often have boards uh, that will oversee a lot of the company's operations and, and major investment decisions. Uh, in our case, uh, that falls to us. Um, we make those decisions and we'll consult with some of our investors occasionally and, and learn from them um, because they are experts in, uh, in business and, and a lot of other fields. And so uh, we'll, we'll go to them when, when we have questions that they might be able to help with. Excellent. And I have one last follow-up on investors before we move to the other part of funding that I think is so extraordinarily valuable that I think it's worth a re-mention. Tom, you had mentioned that because you did not necessarily get the funding from the original list of people, that it forced you to cast your net a lot wider and that a lot of people did come forward and invest in your idea. And I think that's just such a massively valuable nugget for anybody listening out there is cast your net wide, ask people because you never know who's really just going to believe in you, right? If you've proven your worth over and over, if you've been extraordinarily successful in other things that you've done, there may be somebody who has money sitting back there and they're looking for the right opportunity. And if they are believing in you, in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit, your passion, in your hard work, they just might be willing to invest in your idea as well. So keep that in mind. It may be people you never thought of. So thanks for letting me have that little soapbox there, but yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was pretty valuable. So now I want to talk about the last part, maybe the last part of financing this deal, the seller financing. I think you mentioned there's something like 10 to 20% seller financing worked into this deal. So how is seller financing usually structured and how is it structured for this deal? Yeah. Oftentimes sellers will take notes of, of 10 to 20% of the purchase price and there's a benefit there for the sellers. Oftentimes, uh, they get a tax benefit by deferring some of the money that is being paid to them. Um, so they often like it. You can also work in uh, earnouts where the seller participates in some upside if the company continues to grow. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there uh, to um, add that uh, debt component into the deal. Um, you know, but one thing to keep in mind with the SBA financing. Uh, combined with the seller financing, the SBA puts a lot of restrictions on how seller financing is structured. Uh, for example, a seller note uh, in an SBA deal will need to be on full standby for two years, and some sellers don't want to wait two years to get some of their money. And, and that's, uh, so stepping back, that, that's great. A lot of people ask, what is the incentive for the seller to actually hold a note? And people are scared to ask sellers to hold a note. I see this both in the business world and the, in, in the real estate world, um, because we always think, well, why would they want to do that? But you just provided two really good examples. One, they may get tax benefits out of it. And two, um, it gives them the opportunity to in some way stay in the deal and you can negotiate an earn out so that if the business continues to do well, they have additional upside over and above just whatever the purchase price was. So just that that's a great point and something our listeners should keep in mind. Don't yeah. be scared to ask for that seller financing. It's not just a benefit to you as the buyer. It can also be a benefit to the seller as well. And, and Jay, just, just one quick thing on that. 
my perception of this is that it's actually relatively expected to be, they expect to be asked for about 10 to 20%. So Charlie and Sean disagree with me if that's not your understanding of it, but I, I think it's, I think it's very standard. And, and for us, when we talk to the, the business owners, they usually seemed open to that. There were definitely some who said, no, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm washing my hands. But a lot of people seemed open to 20, 10 to 20%. And there were a few who were perfectly happy to take bigger than that. So like to, to build on your point, people shouldn't be hesitate. People should not hesitate to ask. I love that. I love that. Okay. So I, I probably should have asked this earlier, um, but I'm really curious. So there are three of you. Um, I presume the three of you have a different set of skills that together you have like just, a, a, you make up a great team. How do you divvy, divvy up the uh, the responsibilities for this particular business um, or for the company in general? Um, what, what do each of you do and, and where, where does your expertise lie? Well, um, you know, if we want to go with titles, I'm the CEO of the company. Sean is the CFO of the company. Charlie is the COO of the company. Um, so, so, you know, in those basic buckets, we, we work in those basic buckets, but a lot of what we're doing, you know, because the company works very well, already was working well, and we have great middle management that we've built underneath us. And I should mention that the, um, you know, the general manager was the, of the company was the son of the seller, and he's as much leadership as any of us. And he runs the sales operation. He's the sales guru, you know, with, and he's, he's a huge help to us. Um, but because of that, a lot of what we do is creative. We're, we're, we spend a lot of time brainstorming and talking about how can we take this to the next level? How can we innovate? How can we stay a step ahead? And so we kind of take turns having ideas really. And then when I've got the good, you know, when I've got what I think is a good idea, they shoot me down. And when they've got their good idea, you know, maybe I'll try to shoot them down. And I guess my point is that when you have a good, well-functioning partnership, you kind of naturally know what to do and when to do it. And you know what everybody else's workload is. So when Sean is buried in some kind of horrible paperwork, maybe I'll try to take that off of him. If he knows I'm doing a lot, he takes it off of me. And it just kind of, it's like a good basketball team on offense where you just know where everybody is and, and when to shoot him the pass, you know? Love it. I love it. So with all these combined skill sets and everyone playing off of each other and brainstorming together mm. and ideating and figuring out how to go to the next level, just tell us about the results. So how long has it been since the purchase of your company? And would you say that overall this investment has been a success? Yeah. So we've owned the company now for two and a half years. And uh, in the two-year period after the acquisition, we were able to uh, double revenue and we grew from 27 employees uh, to 47 employees now. Um, so really great results. Uh, and it's we certainly didn't expect to grow as much as we did. I think for most people buying a company, uh, they shouldn't plan on seeing uh, such huge growth. Uh, we initially had told our investors that we were planning on uh, about 5 to 15% annual growth, uh, which is 15% would still be pretty aggressive. Um, but we have a great team at the company. Um, the employees that we inherited uh, were all wonderful to work with, and uh, they've contributed a lot to, to growing this. Um, you know, we've also expanded beyond uh, the initial territories that we purchased. Um, we operated only in North Carolina, Virginia, D.C., and West Virginia. Uh, we now own the rights to operate uh, in uh, New York and Western Pennsylvania, and so we're expanding geographically a lot, and I think we'll continue to see a lot of growth going forward. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Um, so I assume that um, you've learned some lessons along the way. I think, Tom, actually, you you had implied that there was a weird situation um, that you had with a PowerPoint designer. Could you, <laughs> any of you want to talk about um, any weird lessons or any lessons learned along the way that that uh, would be valuable for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, this is really more of a, of a funny story that can be spun as a lesson if I really try hard. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in the process of pitching investors, we were, you know, we were building a slide deck. And, and one of the points we were trying to make about the type of company we wanted was what I mentioned earlier about we don't want a tech company. We don't want to be competing against the, the, you know, the young geniuses and the next Mark Zuckerberg. So, you know, our plan was to be speaking to that to investors over a slide of Mark Zuckerberg looking all trendy, you know, in his, uh, in his hoodie and in his trendy office. And, and, and we told this designer who we, this was an, an outsourced project because we were self-funding and really trying to, to pinch pennies. And so, so we lined up a designer in India and he was really good and he spoke good English. Um, but we told him, all right, we want a picture of Zuckerberg looking trendy with a sweatshirt, Zuckerberg looking fly. 
And so, <laughs> and so a couple weeks later, we get the deck back and he did a great job, but there was one slide that was really, really extremely confusing to us. And I'll show it to you and I'll, I'll explain because I know a lot of listeners aren't going to see this, but this is what we, <laughs> <laughs> this is what we received. That is amazing. <laughs> right. So, oh my goodness. So what, you're, what, what, what we're all looking at is a picture of Mark Zuckerberg's smiling face with a, the terrifying body of a fly <laughs> attached to it. Um, and so, so, you know, we were just, it had been weeks and we had never really thought about the direction, I guess, that carefully, the wording of it. And, and we had no idea what had happened. We were so confused, racking our brains, laughing a lot. Um, and then we finally figured out, oh, we said looking fly and he's from India and does not know this colloquialism. So, so, uh, you know, I guess that's the lesson learned if we really want to push it. If you're working with designers from other countries, just be careful about the direction. Don't tell them things like make Mark Zuckerberg look fly. Doesn't work. Uh, um, I'll tell you, we didn't need a lesson from that. That, was, that story was worth it. Just <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the picture again. I hope any listeners can go, you know, if you can go back and watch the tape, it's worth it. It's pretty, it's pretty comical. If anybody wants to put that on a t-shirt, we have the rights to it. So we want royalties. <laughs> yes, we, we, have the, we have that book title and we've got this. Don't touch it. <laughs> that is just phenomenal all the yeah. way around. I love it. I love it. So let's, uh, we're, we're so far into this interview and I could go on for hours, but um. I want to go to like next steps. Charlie, I want to hear from you. First of all, um, I think it's really important to note for our listeners, uh, your company is called Blue Zone Partners. And I personally love the the naming convention behind that. So I would love if you could take a quick minute and let our listeners know um, why and how you chose that name for your company. And then also would love to hear what Blue Zone Partners uh, has next on the horizon and what's coming up. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a, a great story. We uh, Tom actually had had read a book called The Blue Zones, uh, and and for those who aren't familiar, it's it's all about uh, these particular places in the world where people live to great ages, and not only do they live to great ages like you know a hundred plus, but they live really good lives. You know, they're they're not in bed, you know, being kept alive by machines for the last ten years of life. No, no, they are very active. Uh, you know, mentally and physically. You know, up until up until they pass away at whatever whatever age. And, you know, uh, this, this uh, author had, had done some research trying to figure out why it is that people live, live that way. And he, you know, he hit on a few things, diet, exercise, you know, leading a stress-free life. And, you know, after our time in politics, this really appealed to all three of us uh, because that's not the life you lead in politics. You, you know, you eat pizza every night and you stress out until midnight and then you wake up and you do it all over again. It's work hard, live short. Yeah, work hard, live short. Exactly. <laughs> So, you know, we, we all read the book. We were all kind of inspired by it. And we realized that what we were trying to do was find a company that took this application, this sort of, you know, perfect mix of attributes. And we were looking for that as a, in, in company form, you know, enduringly profitable is just another way of saying blue zone business. Uh, so we thought it was just a perfect mixture of, of something we were personally interested in and uh, what we were professionally trying to do at the time. So we head on blue zone partners and we take it pretty seriously. You know, we, we like to work for a business that we consider a blue zone business. And we also like to ensure that our employees are living a blue zone lifestyle. And that it extends to ourselves as well. Um, this means extending people, you know, extra vacation. It means paying people a good wage. Um, it means just ensuring that none of our employees are so stressed out that they can't live a good, meaningful life and that they always have time to do things uh, like, you know, be with their family. Um, so we, we take it very seriously from uh, both the, the acquisition standpoint and then also the management standpoint of our business, uh, Blue Zone Partners. Um, so that's the, the answer there. And, and then to answer your next question about what's next, right now we have so much work left to do uh, with Precision Safe Sidewalks that we're, we're very focused on that. Uh, we grew, as Sean mentioned, 100% in the first two years, and we are excited to continue growing uh, as, we, as we go on here. So um, this is what's great about having the three of us. There are, are, are so many things we can do still to improve this company and grow it. Um, there's no, we're, we're not at a loss of, of activities here. Yeah. And just, and just one, one quick point to add to the blue zone part, you know, a big part of, of what they found with these people who, who lived so long, you know, into their hundreds in many cases was, um, you know, they were always a real, they were part of their community and they did meaningful work. And, and one of the things that we always loved about Precision Safe Sidewalks, our company, um, is that it's meaningful work. I mean, we're, you know, we make these big trip hazards disappear. That helps, that helps parents with strollers. It helps people 
handicapped people, joggers, you know, families that are no longer falling and, and busting their knees. And, and one thing that we definitely learned since we bought this business is that a heck of a lot of that goes on. So I think we feel and, and the people in our company feel that we're doing something meaningful. And, and in that sense, we're becoming a, a part of the community, a healthy part of the community. And, and that is very blue zone. So, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, like, like Charlie said, it's just, we wanted to create a blue zone atmosphere for ourselves and for the, for the company. And, and I think that's what we, we like to think that's what we've achieved. That's awesome. And, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to pretend like I'm smart and I actually knew this. I actually just did a Google search. Um, mm-hmm. but was the book that you're referring to, is it the blue zones living, uh, lessons for living longer from the people who've lived the longest, uh, by national geographic books. You got yeah. it. Okay. Awesome. So for any of our listeners, we'll make sure that's in the show notes. Cause now I want to check out that book now. I can't stand it. 2020 has made me so soft in general. And I'm sitting over here with tears in my eyes, listening to this story, listening to your success, listening to these people who are living more than a hundred years. I just can't, I just can't take it anymore. It's too much amazingness, too much awesomeness in one show. We did it guys. We didn't know that was our goal, but we did it. There you go. Uh, it's really, it's not as hard as, it th- as you think. <laughs> she said, no, you are so mean. Stop it. Okay. Guess what? It is time. Well, it's normally well, time for four more. It's typically four more time, but there's three of you. So we're going to modify four more a little bit today. Does that sound cool? Yes. Yeah. We're, okay. we're just, we're just going to put you on the spot. Mm. So in, instead of asking you the four more questions, uh, we would love to just get from each of you the single best, or maybe the two or five, whatever you want, but at least the single best tip that you have for aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs who are interested in uh, uh, entrepreneurship through acquisition, um, what they should be doing or not doing or thinking about, just what's your best tip? Well, um, I could start, and Sean already touched on this, it's just do it, you know, I, not to accidentally steal Nike's motto, but uh, just do it. We, we had no expertise in this. A lot of people, a lot of people in our industry thought we were totally crazy. What are you guys talking about? You've been, you've been building up this career for 10 years. How could you leave now? And the reason was because we wanted to do it. We wanted to control our own destiny. We wanted to own. Um, and we knew that we were willing to put in the work. So you have to be willing to put in the work. You got to read the business books, go read them, figure out financial intelligence was a great book that I think we all read. That's how we know how to read balance sheets and profit and loss. And and that's how Charlie and Sean learned how to create great models to figure out whether we're going to be profitable or not. Um, you know, just be ready to do the elbow grease and then, and then jump in. Don't worry so much. I just feel that a lot of people are hesitant. Like it's just so much risk. It's just so much risk. And it is. But if you work smart and work careful, you can make it happen. Baby boomers, as you guys know from recent conversations, they're selling their businesses like crazy. We bought our business from a baby boomer. There are great businesses out there. They're great opportunities. And if you really feel like this is a great idea for you, just go ahead and do it. Love it. Love it. Who's next? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in now. And I think you know one of the things that we've, we focus so much on the acquisition process and we, we talked a little bit about, you know, going down to North Carolina and meeting the employees for the first time, but the importance of planning the transition during the time that you're uh, actually doing the, the acquisition, um, I think for us, we, we kind of neglected that to some degree for a, a few months while we were trying to raise the money and deal with the bank and negotiate the purchase agreement. Um, and the seller at one point came to us and said, you know, you guys are, are not thinking through the transition enough. And that was a, a wake up call to us. We then really doubled down on, on thinking through how the transition would look and what we would need to do when we first took over the company. And so uh, that's just w- one point for anybody that's jumping in and doing this is that once you found the company, don't over-focus on the acquisition itself, really think through how you would go about managing things. Love that. Okay, I have three pieces of advice. The first is to to spend money on your lawyer. Our options were to spend a good chunk of money on our lawyer and get a deal done or spend less money and not get a deal done. Uh, our lawyer was absolutely essential to the deal, especially when you're self-funding. It might be your nature to try to find not even a budget option, just an option that you think is going to save you a few bucks. Uh, for us, that would not have been the right choice. Uh, we absolutely had to spend every single penny with our legal team to get this deal done, and it was essential. So don't be afraid uh, to, to do it, to go forward and, and, and spend that cash because uh, you'll actually get a deal done if you do. Um, 
on sort of on that same note, uh, there's a great piece of advice from Dale Carnegie that was passed down to me from my dad, and it's about dealing with situations that are uh, are stressful or, or can go wrong. And the advice is to accept the absolute worst that can happen. Uh, sit there, think about the worst thing that could possibly happen if the deal doesn't get done, if the legal team doesn't do the right work, if you can't line up the investors. And once you really accept that and internalize that, you can move on and solve the problem as opposed to just sort of moping about it. And I will say that as we were getting this deal done, we we dealt with existential crises once a day, it seemed like. And it really required a pretty steady hand on our end to to keep pushing. Otherwise, we might have lost our nerve. So for me, that Dale Carnegie advice was really helpful. And the final piece, and this all goes to the same sort of advice here, is uh, yes, it's important to have humility, as I mentioned earlier, but it's also very important to have self-confidence. We had some situations, particularly when we were trying to get this deal done, where we had to look at a lawyer or an accountant or someone else who had much greater expertise in their particular field and tell them that they were wrong. And if we hadn't had the guts to do that from time to time, again, who knows if the deal would have happened. So if you know something's wrong, if you're pretty sure it's fishy, don't be afraid to speak up and and get an explanation from them. Because even though they're paid the big bucks to do it, uh, you're still just as smart as they are. You're just not just as interested in law or accounting or whatever it is. So have the self-confidence to to go ahead and get the deal done. Wow. Fantastic. Gentlemen, that was fantastic. Um, This episode has been just one tip after another, and it's basically a blueprint for for any of our listeners who are interested in trying to tackle the acquisition of their first business. We wish you the absolute best of luck with uh, with your journey with Precision Safe Sidewalks. We can't wait to hear how it goes. And we look forward to having you back when you guys are ready to move on to your next big acquisition uh, to hear all about that one as well. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. So great to hear your uh, we, stories. Thank we you. We preemptively accept your invitation to come back at a later date. <laughs> I, I, I'm 100% serious about Yay. it. Yay. So thank you. Thank All you. Right. Gentlemen, talk soon. Thanks. Have an awesome right. day, guys. We'll you see too, you, you soon. You too. Take it easy. You too. Bye. Thanks Bye. so much. Seriously, Jay, how absolutely awesome and inspiring were these guys. They have such a great dynamic together. They dropped so many great pieces of knowledge. It's truly no surprise that they've been as successful as they have. They brought their their concurrent backgrounds together, just worked really hard. And they just, you can tell they, they have got this great dynamic working together and they're able to provide us with so many great tips and loved absolutely everything about it. Yeah. And I love the fact that they didn't come into this as business experts or knowing everything there is to know about buying a business. Basically, they were they were learning as they went along. And it's just a good reinforcement that anybody out there that might be interested in acquiring a business can do it if you put in the work and and you just you learn and And you're you just not, do it. You just like do they it. Said, you just do it. You just do it. Absolutely. Okay. Anything else we need to cover on this episode? I think it's about time to wrap it up. Okay. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. We really appreciate you. Have an amazing week. She's Carol. I'm Jay. Now stay humble while having your self-confidence today. Have an awesome week, everybody. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Bye.